one of my greatest mentors is here. I met Richard Lawson in 2009. I had moved to Los Angeles nine years earlier to make an acting career in television, my ultimate dream as a child. At the age of six, I had decided I wanted to be Lucille Ball. <laughs> so during my early years in LA, I had a few successes, but none that matched the dream that played continually in my head. I was way off schedule. I had spent a year and a half signed with my third agent and had only booked one television role and that role was written out of the script two days after I booked the job. I needed help and I went about seeking it. I don't even remember who told me about Richard Lawson but I had heard that he was a great acting teacher and that he could help me achieve my dream. So I went to an orientation at his school, and the moment I walked in the door, it was just exactly like the same moment when I walked in the door at UP. I knew I was home. The first thing I saw when I walked into Richard's acting studio was a yin-yang symbol on his brand logo, and the way it jumped out at me, it might as well have been a flashing sign on the big video screen in the room because it spoke to me as if to say, relax, you're in the right place. I signed up for classes right away and I was sure I was in the right place when he began to speak about acting in terms of energy, alchemy, holding the vision, being, and my personal favorite, dreams don't have expiration dates. I said, wait a minute, those are the same things I hear Reverend Della say every Sunday at church. <laughs> is this a spiritual approach to acting? Well, if it is, I know I'm in the right place. As I continued classes, I came to realize that Richard was not just a great actor and a great acting teacher, but he was also an extraordinary human being. Having traveled roads too difficult for me to even imagine, like surviving an underwater plane crash and completing a tour of duty in Vietnam. Not bitter, not damaged, not shut down, but valiant and renewed. Having emerged from each path more victorious and more dynamic than ever. This is why he has been one of my greatest mentors. He teaches from the rich and varied tapestry that is his life. Because of course, great storytellers don't just happen. Great teachers don't just happen. They evolve according to their life's events and are constructed and shaped by how they walked through those events. In my fourth week of class, I booked not one but two TV shows and the bookings have continued and expanded ever since, but that was only the tip of the iceberg. The more I learned as an actor under Richard's direction, the more I began to observe that his mind worked vastly different than any teacher I'd ever studied with. I affectionately call Richard Lawson Studios acting class on steroids. The faint of heart need not apply. <laughs> because of the manner in which Richard has walked through his life events, living each moment as if it were his last, it is no wonder that you not only learn the art of acting, you learn editing, lighting, sound, film, stage, auditioning, producing, writing, stage management, speech and text work, camera angles, stand-up comedy, improv, and life lessons. <laughs> Not for the faint of heart. You cannot be a great actor without first dealing with yourself from within. And you cannot be a great storyteller until you are unafraid 
to put what you have learned in your life on the screen, or unashamed to leave every bit of your authentic self on that stage. Many, including tons of Hollywood A-listers, have received a 360 degree education from Richard Lawson. For more than a decade, he ran one of the most successful drug rehabilitation programs in the country, administrating the drug education, treatment, and aftercare program for the NBA. Studying with an inventive and remarkable mind like Richard also means that you are a first-hand witness to some of his creations as an inventor, the most recent being something called Dance Fit Walk, a fitness program that he has developed, again, like no other. Gently and patiently, but firmly and with passion and conviction, Richard has guided so many along the steps of their dream, as a father would guide a child to walk or to ride, first with a tricycle, then training wheels, then a bike with no hands. And like any great father, walking the path of the dream with you is not enough. He is careful to weave threads of self-sufficiency within the fabric of that dream so that he doesn't just hand you a fish. By showing me and countless others how to be great filmmakers, or how to write an airtight script, or helping to create the stuff that great producers are made of, he teaches how to fish for a lifetime of independence in an industry that demands it. On this Father's Day, I can accurately say that Richard Lawson has been the father of my dream. So here I stand on Father's Day 2014, and there is no place I would rather be than here with another extraordinary human being, my spiritual mother, Della Reese Led, and with actor, teacher, director, inventor, interventionist, and the father of my dream, a walking, talking, proof of the truth, Richard Lawson. I would put that introduction up against any introduction I've heard for anyone. That is, I hope to be able to live up to that today. Um, thank you so much for your beautiful voice, which I'm, I know so well, because I've heard it so often, and and you as well, ma'am, and, and all the singers that have been up here today is just amazing. And, um, and I'm not surprised because Della is an incredible singer herself. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with her on two different occasions. Um, we did a, a, a pilot uh, for a television series that was a spinoff of MacGyver years ago that I kind of originated and put the idea in the producer's mind and got them thinking and then they wrote this pilot called The Coltons and she pay, played my mother along with Cleavon Little and, um, and um, I forgot who else. Um, anyway, it was, uh, it, they were foolish, they didn't make it happen. How could they not, it was such a great cast. And then I was also in, um, touched by an angel. Um, good morning on this beautiful Father's Day, beautiful Sunday. I feel very blessed and honored to be asked to speak on this special day. I heard somebody say father, mother earlier. And you know, I think that Father's Day and Mother's Day are the two most important days of the year because the one thing that is common for everyone is the fact that we all have fathers and we all have mothers. And most of you are fathers or mothers. And, uh, and the young people in here will be fathers and mothers and they have fathers and mothers. And those are the two most important figures in life because everything that you are is an extension of your parents, whether you know it or not. Sometimes, you know, the things that we are and that we do 
we're not aware of the influences that come through the years and years of things that are passed on. So it's an important day. I'm also grateful that my two children are here. Uh, along with my beautiful... <laughs> <laughs> along with my beautiful and wonderful girlfriend, Tina. Um, as you know, the, the name of this series is called The Proof of the Truth. Um, it's my testimony of how God has delivered me, supported me, prospered me, and positioned me to express my inner greatness. And with their presence here, uh, they are definitely example of my proof of truth. I know that the Holy Spirit has blessed me with an incredible life, and if I were given the choice to change either one of them in any way, I, I would ask for something different because they are perfect in exactly who they are. They are awesome people. I'm proud of the people that they've become and uh, I'm proud of the person that Tina has proven to be. I think between the two of us, we couldn't be more grateful in terms of how our children turned out. <laughs> Being a parent is the hardest and most important job in the world. It's a lifetime occupation that has no set hours. When you sign up for the job, whether you wanted to or not, <laughs> accidents will happen. You realize that it's a 24-7, 365 days times infinity. There are no vacations. There's no time off. You're never done. Even when, when little Karamu and Leticia are long gone and have kids of their own, you are still on call. Even after you've made your transition and you join your ancestors with the Lord, you are still on call. I thank you so much for allowing me to stand here before you today and present all and represent all the fathers and mothers of the world and I humbly thank you for the opportunity to share my story. The subject of my talk today is how to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Yeah. Now I know some of the more mature people in this room really kind of have heard that over the years. But how to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Now what does that mean? First, first of all, it is an idiom or an expression whose meaning is not predictable or usual meanings of, uh, of, its, of its constituent elements, like kick the bucket or hang one's head. A silk purse from a sow's ear, as, as most things in life, are interpreted in one of two ways. As all things, you know, it's either half full or half empty, and it just really truly depends on how you look at it. I heard people speak earlier and there were things uh, that you talked about in terms of how you look at something is going to determine how you go about it. You can see it half full or you can see it half empty. So a silk person, a sow's ear on the positive side is to produce something refined admirable and valuable from something which is unrefined, unpleasant, or of little or no value. Most people see it on the negative side, which is it is impossible to make something fine out of something inferior or substandard material. When I look back across the landscape of my wonderful, crazy, unpredictable, challenging, inspired, driven, empowered, spontaneous, and blessed life, I am certainly reminded of the pile of sow's ears that I, 
that has knocked me down or made me want to give up or broke my heart or held me underwater or damn near killed me in one way or another, whether it was mentally, physically, or spiritually. I have literally had a number of near-death experiences. I will share with you a few of these experiences and how my higher power delivered me, supported me, prospered me, positions me here today to express my inner greatness. The first thing I have to look at and acknowledge is my mother, father, Gertrude Noella Broussard. She was a saint. She was a single parent. She raised me and my sister. by herself. She worked 16 hours a day for 16 years as a nurse. She made the most of her high school education and she worked like a German mule. That's the way she said it, she liked to say that. And provided us with the best that she could under the circumstances. She saved her money and bought one little house after another till she was financially stable. Along the way, she was always helping people. We always had someone living with us. House was always full of people. I never remember a time that there wasn't somebody who lived in our house. She stopped nursing. She started a family home where she cared for 16 mentally challenged people. She also adopted three foster children at the same time. She had three little kids and 16 mentally challenged people. She was a natural born caretaker. She wasn't the easiest to get along with nor understand. She might have worked like a German mule, but she was as stubborn as American mule. In her world, there were two ways to do things, her way or the wrong way. She didn't talk much and she didn't have much affection. She just worked her butt off. She didn't go to church much, but every night she would always read her Bible right next to the bed. She didn't really have much time to go to church because she was always caring for people. Needless to say, she was tough to live with and hard to love. She wasn't very nurturing. Her sister, my Gussie, Aunt Gussie, was more maternal in my life, but she lived in Southern California, we lived in Northern California. I loved my mother because I was supposed to. I mean, how can you not love your mother? But I just didn't like her. Till one night while I was freebasing cocaine in my bathroom in Chicago, where I was doing a series called Chicago Story, I called her and asked her why she never hugged me kissed me, held me, or told me that she loved me. After the longest silence, she started crying. And she said, I didn't know how, because no one had ever done that to me. We both were in tears at that point. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit washed over me and all of my considerations and anger and frustrations and misunderstandings were washed away. I had such love for Gertie at that moment. I suddenly realized that she worked that hard because that was the only way that she knew how to show her love. 
She did the best she could. She dedicated her entire life to the cause of making a better life for her children as a single woman. When I look at the content of my character and what I got from my mother, and thank you for saying all those wonderful things that you said, because that is Gertie. All of that was Gertie. I got all that from my mother. I realized how truly blessed I am. All the things that I initially perceived as the sow's ear in my growing up experiences turned out to be silk purses. Through the Holy Spirit working through me, I realized that those things that I initially perceived as less losses turned out to be the greatest lessons of my life. And it has positioned me to express my inner greatness. Some of the qualities that I got from Gertie, she never gave up on her dream to change her life through dedication and hard work. She never gave up. She was the most loyal person you could find. She cared about people. She was always taking care of someone and helping, reaching out. She taught me to be a gentleman. She taught me to respect myself and therefore other people and especially women. She had a great empathy for people. She knew that if she put her mind to something that it would be done. Her inability to express outwardly taught me the importance of it. The fact that I wasn't able to open, the, the fact that I wasn't able to openly talk to her about anything made me realize the importance of the communication. I communicate about everything. A lack of communication harbors secrets. We are only as big, we are only as sick as our biggest secret. We have to communicate. Her discomfort in showing affection made me want to be affectionate and be a more affectionate person. Her humongous giving spirit has influenced me to be a giver of love, of time, of understanding, of patience, of empathy. They were hard lessons, but they were lessons for a lifetime. Thank you, Heavenly Spirit, for helping me understand how to find the good and praise it especially my mother who dedicated her life to help me and my sister to create a better life for ourselves. God bless you and continue to rest in peace, mother. And please, please, don't try to control the Lord. <laughs> My mother left my father, L.B. Lawson, when I was six and started her journey as mother-father. L.B. was a barber. He was a very handsome man. He looked like he should be a leading man in some romantic love story. He lived in San Francisco after the divorce, and we lived in Oakland. I would go to his barber shop in San Francisco to get my hair cut. I remember vividly the day that the world changed for me. I was sitting in his barber chair, and he was trimming the nap of my neck, you know, and my head was down, and I remember those scissors, those clippers going zzz, zzz, zzz. The patron waiting to get his hair cut was sitting there right across from me, and the patron said, Hey, Lawson, is that your son? Zzz, zzz, zzz. After a long, deadly pause that was filled with subtext, where the sound of those clippers kept getting louder and louder till they, became, can't, they began to sound like an excavating equipment. He said, well, that's what his mama said. <laughs> those words became, became exploding landmines in my mind. That was the beginning of a 40-year spiral down a hole that I couldn't seem to get out of mentally. We don't have enough time to talk about all the holes that were created in my soul trying to figure that out. The one thing I was certain of was by that day that LB was not my father, but I didn't have any proof. I never asked about it because my mother wasn't the kind of person that you wanted to go and ask some kind of question like that. I love living too much to go and ask, hey, mom, uh, is daddy my daddy? Oh, no, no. 
So I didn't communicate. So I just kept it inside and let it spin into all kinds of issues that were well camouflaged on the outside that no one would ever know. But there was this inner world of this little boy who grew up to be a man on his own and was lost with the sense of abandonment. And I didn't understand. I didn't understand. I think it was a real motivating force for me to become an actor. I was able to put all those unresolved emotions into characters I played. I was able to play this stuff with heartfelt passion. And people thought that, wow, what a great actor. <laughs> well, that might be true. But I was working it out, and I was putting it in this character, and I was putting it in this character. And I found that it was helping people, and it was a form of ministry. Because I was telling the truth of my experience through the characters that I played. When my mother passed away in 1993, that night I buried her, I was looking through her papers, and I found this christening papers. It was written in part thick parchment papers, like, almost like a grocery bag, it's so thick. They used a fountain pen to write all the particulars. On the line that says, Father, the name was erased out. But they couldn't erase it out all the way. So I saw that name underneath, but on, there was another name underneath. It had a C in it. And on top it said L.B. Lawson. That paper had so much energy that it felt like I was holding a person. It vibrated in my hand. My mother's sister, G uh, uh, Gussie, her, she signed the papers as a witness back then. I called, she was in the next room, I called her in. She saw, looked at the paper and she turned white. <laughs> secrets. Yes. We're only as sick as our biggest secret. She almost turned white, she was at least gray. So she was in charge of the lie and the secret. Now what was she gonna do with it? I thought she was gonna have a heart attack. She stood there and she got small and she started shaking and she lied and she went into the next room and she said, I don't know, Ricky, believe me, I don't know. She went into the next room. An hour later she came back and she was humble and she said, well, you know, I think you gotta call your cousin Iva. She and your mom came out to California together. So I called Iva, and Iva said the truth, that L.B. Lawson was not my father. She got real vague about who it was, but she said he was not my father. She took it to the grave, and I wouldn't tell you, but because you're asking me, he's not your father. Buried her. For the next three years, I'm still tripping. Until I finally decided to say, wait a minute, I'm responsible for how I feel about L.B. Lawson. Let me sit down and let me write this letter to L.B. Lawson and claim myself back. All right, come on. And I wrote that letter and I said, L.B., I said, listen, Thank you so much for what you gave me because you know what, it was fun in the first six years when I was with him because I just saw he was such a Pied Piper. He was this handsome, tall guy. Everybody loved him. Everybody loved him and he was so good with everybody except he was a little distant with me and that was weird for me. I didn't understand it. But I said, listen, thank you. I don't know what really went on between you and my mother, but you know, I apologize for whatever feelings you had about it. But listen, you go on in peace. I release you from any responsibility <laughs> for me. I just hope that you decided to become something worthwhile and not be a rock or a turtle or something. <laughs> I had to have a little humor about it. I read it to a friend and I burned it. That was 2 a.m. Thursday morning. 2 a.m. Thursday afternoon, I went to get my hair cut. So I'm sitting in a barber chair again. And this girl comes up to the this, to this thing right next to me and she sets her stuff down. And this is an empty, this stall had been empty for months. But she came in and I said, I, I know you, right? 
She said, yeah, I know. So, uh, yeah, right, right. You've got cousins in Louisiana. Yeah, yeah so you, you're doing what you're doing here today. She said, well, I'm just here for the day, just checking it out. And she says, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, I got to say it. I got to say it. Forgive me for saying it. But Walter Trahan is your father. <laughs> All I could do was laugh. It was like the universe, the Holy Spirit said, boom. I couldn't have this information because I was too, it was too, and it was all over me. I couldn't have that information. But the moment I gave it up, the truth came in. The moment I got quiet about it, the truth came in. The moment that I released all that energy, it let room for the, the truth to come in. Silk purse into a sow's ear. I'm going to close by this. She mentioned the plane crash. I think it's important to share that. So March 22nd, 1992, I'm catching a plane to Cleveland to go work on the drug program. I'm going to the Cleveland Cavaliers to talk about you know, drug education, training, treatment, and aftercare. After my episode of, of, of drugs, I went to treatment and to rehab, and I got help. And then I got knowledge. And then I knew what I was talking about in terms of helping people. And so I started working on the program and helping people. Helping, and I still to this day, to a certain extent, I'm an interventionist. But I'm going to Cleveland. There's a snowstorm. My spirit tells me that do not get on this plane. The moment I'm about to get on the plane, it becomes really clear that this plane is going to crash. In my sp I, spiritually, I know this. I know this. I know this. I know this. But we have another side to us. There's one side that said, don't do that. And then there's another side. No, oh, no, because, you know, we got to do this thing. You know, why you want to do that? Just go. People going to think you stupid and scared. What you going to do? T tell people that you were scared to fly? Go sit your butt down, boy. <laughs> and I'm battling my spirit and my public self that's concerned about all these middle class things. And I stay on that plane. Right up to the very last minute that this battle is going on. But I stay on that plane, and the plane crashes on takeoff. We wind up in Flushing Bay, upside down. I'm trapped in my seat. Now I'm looking at this. I didn't have to be here. I could have stopped that plane from taking off because I had the information, and I didn't do anything with it. My first thought was, I'm in a plane crash, I'm under water, trapped in my seat. There's nothing that I can do. I'm going to die. So let me be quiet and let me die in peace because I didn't want them to feel my energy struggling. I was going to be peaceful so that they can go in peace and know that I'm good. And then something else came over me. I heard my mother's voice. I heard all the positive input that I had gotten over the years came to me and said, get up, get up, go now. And I responded and I got up out of that water undid the thing, put stuff off of me, and I was oxygen deficient, and I had seconds. And finally, I hit the surface of the water, and somewhere in the distance, I heard this yell, this scream, and it sounded like a baby at birth, that wail. 
And later on, I realized that it was me, and it was my own rebirth. And this hand came through a hole in the fuselage and said, let me help you and pull me out through this hole in the plane. Never saw the face. I was worried about the fact that I couldn't breathe and pulled me out of the plane. I really understand how guided I was through that. When I was on the plane, I sat in 6A. This kid recognized me, the ticket agent, and moved me to 1F. The girl who sat in 6A died. This is, an, you know, if this is not an example of the Holy Spirit working in a way to guide me through this maze of possibilities and allows me to stand here today and talk to you about the fact that you can change anything in your universe. It is never too late. Because every answer that you need is within you. It's within you. You don't have to look anywhere else. You will have the choice of going down one road or another, and it's about whether or not you are at peace enough to make the right decision. So it's never too late. Dreams don't have expiration dates. There's a lot of other things I could share because my life has been an interesting thing. But what I know is, is that life is how you choose to live it. You understand? You can look at things and you could look at half full or half empty. You could take something and make it, you can take nothing and make it into something. And it all boils down at the end of the day about how you look at it and how you are willing to listen to your spirit because the answer is within you.